Welcome to Nevada Newsmakers on the broadcast today. It's an all-pundit show with Don Tatro, Sam Kumar, and Chris Wicker. It's all coming up next on the all-new Nevada Newsmakers. From your house to the White House, the folks at D&D Roofing can get it fixed with their eyes closed. Nearly 200,000 Nevadans work in retail businesses, supporting families and the community. Nevada's retail businesses generated over $2 billion in sales tax revenue in one year, including nearly $700 million to help our schools. Shop around and see all that Nevada's retailers offer our state. We're the Retail Association of Nevada, representing thousands of Nevada businesses. Businesses that work for Nevada. Pro Group Management is the place where companies can find workers' comp solutions that are designed to meet their specific business requirements. As regulations evolve, Pro Group takes a proactive approach to clear the path to make sure your business stays ahead of the curve. Knowing your workers' comp program is optimized, you can focus on other important matters related to your growing business. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. Safety is the number one priority for the trucking industry. Over $7 billion a year is spent on technology like this electronic eye that will apply the brakes automatically. But the most important factor for safety is the truck driver. These hardworking men and women who safely move over 70% of our nation's freight and 94% of Nevada's. We thank you because trucks move America forward. This is Nevada Newsmakers with host Sam Shad, a no holds barred political forum. Now, from the Nevada Newsmakers broadcast headquarters, here is Sam Shad. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we have an all-pundit show today, and it's a great lineup. Uh, Sam Kumar is here, the past chairman of the Washoe County Republicans. Chris Wicker is the former state Democratic Party vice chair and member of the DNC. And Don Tatro is executive director of the Builders Association in Northern Nevada. Okay, so let's start with you, Chris. I'm just going to say one word, Virginia. <laughs> uh, Virginia is very disappointing right now and you know on the one hand you have the the three top state officials uh, finally they're all Democrats and and look at the mess we have and uh, it's interesting that uh, the national pretty much the national Democrats that you hear about are calling on the governor to to resign yet it looks like a majority of Virginians uh, don't want him to resign and I heard him on uh, the TV today, and he's holding firm. He, he, he actually gave a rational interview to Gail King today, as opposed to what he, his two previous interviews about the blackface and Ku Klux Klan picture. You know, it's, it's hard to make a decision on that. We all know that uh, blackface is very much uh, a racist item, but um, you think about uh, Virginia in 1984, I don't know, I wasn't there. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if it becomes a problem where he's perceived as a racist, then he would have to resign, I think. Um, and it's interesting for those that don't know, Virginia is, you're a one-term governor, so you're a lame duck from day one. So does that play into this, that the uh, Democrats would like to hold on to uh, the governorship? You know, I think from what I've seen, uh, most of the Democrats have not uh, put party ahead of what they think should happen, what the right thing to be is. Uh, some of the, uh, I think the, the Virginians that voted, the actual Virginians, I think want the governor to stay in place. And so uh, I think he will probably draw on that support from uh, uh, the population of Virginia to stay in office. I mean, he, he gives no indication that he's going to resign. And um, if he can overcome a racist image, I guess that's fine. But if he can't overcome it, then he does need to resign. Uh, Don, it was interesting. Uh, Chris uh, mentioned Gail King's interview, and I watched the first part of that interview on Face the Nation, and it was fascinating because Gail is quite a character. I mean, she goes from light entertainment to serious stuff, and 
She would ask a question, the governor would avoid answering the question, but give a completely different answer, and then she would jump right back in and smack him upside the head with the question again. Uh, she gave him no quarter, but did it in such a nice way until she put the knife in, uh, but it was a great interview. She is a, a, a wonderful interviewer, probably underrated. I think she has Oprah whispering in her ear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually didn't watch the interview, but um, she is great. I've seen her before on a variety of different things. Uh, what I think you have in the governor, at least in Virginia, is that is exactly how to mismanage a situation from day one. Any crisis communications expert is just <laughs> shaking their head at every step of the way. I did, I didn't, um, and then almost had to, his wife had to tell him not to moonwalk uh, on the stage. Th these are, it's ridiculous how that was handled. I think had it been handled differently, you might be seeing a different outcome. I don't, I don't know that, I think the national pressure though is, is, is going to, um, eventually run him out or make him even more of a lame duck, as you mentioned. Um, one of the things that happens in politics, Sam, all the time is that when entertainers, for example, come under fire for one reason or another, the sponsors, you know, start pulling their advertising dollars and the broadcasters pull the programs. Um, do you think the same thing is going to apply here where because if they, I guess if they uh, use the right time frame, they can replace all of these three offices with Democrats, um, that donors are going to be demanding the resignations here? I haven't seen that happen as much on the left, and not to pick on the liberals, I think problems are there on both sides, but typically such cries come of boycotts and stuff from that from the left, and when you look at it, even with Justin Fairfax, there's a significant contrast between what's happening with him and what happened with Brett Kavanaugh. You know, accusation, even though there's no evidence that Kavanaugh even met his accuser ever in his life, all of a sudden he's no longer qualified. Justin Fairfax, there's at least prima facie evidence they have met, they both agree, they're two different versions, but the same standard does not apply to Justin Fairfax, which I find it interesting. But more to the point about Ralph Northam, my concern is applying today's standards to events that happened 30 years ago. How things were in back in 84, I have no idea, and Chris, you pointed to that. But just last week he was on a radio show, which is on videotape, where he's talking about letting babies die after the birth. That to me is a much, much bigger problem than you know some college student doing stupid things insensitive 30 some years ago. Um, Chris, you would like yeah, to I, unpack the whole series two, of things. Two, two things. I think that uh, uh, Sam overstated uh, the lack of uh, contact between uh, Kavanaugh and his accusers. I, I think uh, there was knowledge of each other uh, pretty, pretty clearly in the facts. Uh, but I would jump to uh, what Governor Northam said, and uh, his interview was uh, clipped. There are, it is video. Sam is right. There is video that suggests that. But the context of the conversation dealt with uh, delivery of a non-viable fetus and, and what to do in, in that context. And, and I don't think Governor Northam ever, and he sa has said this, never intended to suggest that a viable baby could be delivered and, and people could decide to commit infanticide. You know, that's clearly murder. And, uh, and so I think his, his ill uh, poor use of words taken out of context has led to what, what Sam has, has stated is a, a rallying call that uh, even President Trump has picked up on uh, uh, to inflame the, the anti-abortion group and, and it was never intended that way. That was not the context of it. All right, let's take a break. More with our All Pundit Show when we come back. Tamarack Junction is South Reno's hotspot with over 450 of the latest slots and video games. Sully Sports Bar, the Dining Car Restaurant, William Hill Sportsbook, and the Tamarack Steakhouse and Lounge. We're just north of the Summit Mall in South Virginia. Yeah. How do you shed some light on a better economy? Start with growth inspired by Valley Electric Association. We're a member-owned power company that puts Nevada first, and we're doing big things like providing prosperity by securing renewable energy projects. For Nevada, that means more jobs and more opportunities, all for a strong statewide economy. In other words, together, we're doing powerful things. Visit us at vea.coop to learn more. Hi, I'm Eric Robnett, owner of Home Energy Experts. Has this ever happened to you? 
Honey, did you remember to turn down the thermostat? <sighs> Forgetting to set the temperature? Not fun. We can help. Our new smart thermostat keeps the temperature set for your comfort all by itself. I'm feeling hot now. <sighs> to increase your comfort, go to homeenergyexperts.com for details. That's homeenergyexperts.com. The signs and symptoms of cataracts can start out small with subtle changes in your vision. So don't wait. Be proactive and take your vision into your own hands. If you're experiencing the onset of cataracts or just have questions, contact your eye care professional or call Eye Care Associates of Nevada today. Dr. Hiss has years of experience specializing in the surgical correction of eye disorders and has completed over 84,000 vision correcting procedures. At Eye Care Associates of Nevada, we'll change the way you look at the world. The Tamarack Junction Steakhouse is known for signature steaks, handcrafted cocktails, and world-class wines. Join us Thursdays and Friday nights from 4.30 to 6.30 in the Steakhouse Lounge for live music, gourmet plates, and well-priced wines just north of the Summit Mall on South Virginia. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we have an all-pundit show going here. It's a great one so far. Don Tatro, Sam Kumar, and Chris Wicker are all here. So, Don, it seems to me that... You know, over the last couple of years, we just seem to see be seeing a revival of the 60s, uh, potentially because of social media, because of news networks, things that weren't around back in those days. Um, but anything that goes on can be amplified to such a great degree. You think this is a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I wasn't around in the 60s. Great music <laughs> came from Thank it. Thank you. But you probably <laughs> heard about it in your history books. Sure, yeah. But um, <laughs> what I do think we have come to as a nation, uh, during that time, I think there was a, a more of a focus, I guess more similar to the Iraq War and Vietnam. I, I think you can draw that parallel a little closer. But right now, I think we have uh, the emerging of social media and this. We're always in a crisis. We're now facing another government shutdown. We're always in some political scandal. There's never a day that goes by where we're actually talking just substance. And I, I know in the, back in the day we were doing that too, but the, you, could, you could find it. There was an area, there was an outlet, and now we have this continued uproar from so many people. I don't know where in history you find that again, um, but you know, I think the 60s comparison is, is true in that you had different, uh, I guess, political, parties and talk, you had communism talking about then, you had um, and a few of those different things going on. But now, I just think we're in this continued crisis mode where the substance that's getting out is just buzzwords and it's hard to talk back to those buzzwords and, and come up with a real path of governing. So my hope is whatever the information age and Twitter and social media is getting us, we actually find a way to get back into substance and away from this um, petty name calling, oh wow, good jab on Twitter by this person and this person, and actually get into the substance of governing. And I think I call for that every show, but <laughs> maybe someday somebody will listen. I, I hope so. Um, Chris, yeah. uh, you and I both did live through the 60s. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Don said. I, I would characterize it kind of this way, that the 60s were kind of a uh, upheaval against uh, open and obvious cultural norms. You know, uh, you know sex, drugs, uh, authority, war, that sort of thing. And now we're seeing an upheaval against the cover-up of, of bad behavior that used to be brushed under the rug, uh, accepted by some people and ignored by other people. Uh, with the Me Too movement, what we see in, with the Virginia officers, uh, you, you see kind of an upheaval against what had previously been accepted or covered up, but now we don't want to do that anymore and it's all being brought to the fore and it's going to bring the downfall, how it already has brought the downfall of numerous people. And it'll be an upheaval that we'll get through and then we'll, we'll move on. And, uh, and the trouble, I agree with Don, the, the social media ha creates a rush to judgment situation almost every time. But more and more, I'm hearing from people that are turning off their social media. They're disconnecting from Facebook, Instagram, and other places because of this, that, that it's driving them crazy. And... You know, it, it, headline writers, you know, always would write a headline that didn't necessarily reflect the story, but took a little piece of the story and made it exciting so somebody would want to read that story. Um, and it seems like that's what's going on now, um, except it's in every medium that you can find. And I think people are, are getting more and more turned off to news, to social media. 
uh, because they don't want this constant negativity and fear that really isn't warranted. I mean, when you look at the lives that we have, that we are fortunate enough to have in the greatest country in the world, mm -hmm. if you have a job and you have a family, um, you know, and you have a home, um, you're doing very well by comparison with a lot of people around the world. Oh, clearly, by far. I, I think that we also, there are a couple of dynamics taking place. We all live in our own bubbles. We live in identical neighborhoods and we interact with the same kind of people like us. So we are totally disconnected from certain other segments of society. And then add to that the fact we get on Facebook or Twitter or whatever our favorite media is, we start saying stuff because we never have to meet the other person. If you meet the person, then you get a human aspect of it. I mean, my opinions on homosexuality was completely different 10, 15 years ago. And as I learned, some of my friends are homosexuals. You look at the person, you say, this is a good person. That's his preference. We need to let him live his life or her life the way he or she chooses. It humanizes the problem when you get to know people. And same holds for politics. I mean, I am fortunate to have some good liberal friends and I have honest conversations with them. Not that we agree, we have our own opinions, but when we dig a level deeper, we see, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. And that's what is missing with social media. It's one-liners, 140, 280 characters, whatever the case may be. You can throw that, you know, pull the pin, lob the grenade, and you can walk away. And then the rest of the people are fighting over there. And yes, there's clearly that. And one final point I want to make, we talk about divisiveness in the country. And that's significant. I don't know how it compares to 30, 40, 50 years back and stuff like that. But the role of the media in creating that division cannot be understated because it is just, they play it over and over and over again so that you, know, you can shore up your base to watch your show and sell commercials. Well, and, and you, you make the point in your last sentence there, which is and to sell the commercials, and that's what it's all about, is making money. Let's take a break, and then we'll take the most dangerous step to Carson City when we come <laughs> back. <laughs> Dimitri Prine here for Design Outdoor. Are you a homeowner who's interested in remodeling or building a home? At Design Outdoor, we can show you how adding natural or manufactured masonry stone can add beauty and value to your home. And we refer only the best contractors. Our store and backyard are located at 11600 South Virginia, just north of DeMonte Ranch Parkway. Visit designoutdoor.com or call us at 851-9499. One of the most psychologically damaging things parents can do to children in divorce is disparage one another, which is why I can't believe I even have to make this commercial. Half of your kids' genetics come from this person you're spewing hate about. Your children have the right to love you both, but more than that, they deserve to love themselves. Marilyn York might be a men's rights divorce attorney, but this is for every selfish parent. Shut up! Hi, I'm Dave Newman. Remember me? I used to be the house detective, and now I'm a realtor, full-time at Remax Realty Affiliates. And a lot of people ask me, how's the market? You know what? It's fantastic. If you're even kicking around the idea of buying or selling, give me a call. Let's talk about it. Call me at Remax Realty Affiliates and just ask for the guy who used to be the house detective, Dave Newman. Everyone is talking about opioids, but they're not the only drugs that can be harmful if taken in large quantities or not as prescribed. You also need to be aware of side effects from anxiety drugs, muscle relaxants, sleep aids, and stimulants. Mixing prescription drugs with other drugs or alcohol can be dangerous. If you take Ambien with a glass of wine, it may be enough to stop you from breathing. Prescribed drugs can be just as dangerous as illegal drugs. Take medications only as directed. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we have an all-pundit show going here with Chris Wicker, Sam Kumar, and Don Tetro. Um, so a big story over the weekend, to me at least, was that Governor Sisolak went to the legislature, actually walked through the courtyard and went to the legislature, which is something that Governor Sandoval did very, very rarely. What does this say to you about potentially 
this new governorship? I, don't, I was there. I actually saw him in the gift shop. I don't know what he was buying, but a uh, smile on his face. A lot of people w coming over to shake his hand, constituents and uh, lobbyists, obviously, were, were ready to do that and elected. So it was a lot of fun. I don't know. It shows to me that he's probably going to be very engaged and he's going to be a very hands-on. I think Sandoval sat back and let the legislation come to him. He may have given his preference, have talked with his leadership, and then sort of let, let it be. I think Sisolak might be um, a little more engaged in the process or um, having, uh, having his hand in the legislation a little bit more in, in which bills he wants to come see with the priorities. Um, and so I don't, I don't envy any of the three leaders there on the executive side <laughs> or in both sides <laughs> of the House because what you prioritize now and how you move it and who's, uh, who's you're going to help out. And that is a very difficult situation right now. But it shows to me that he's going to be very engaged. He was over there, had, had a smile on his face, and then saw him that night at the State of the City for Reno. Right, so right, which yeah. was an interesting political move. Absolutely. As it was the same night as the State of the Union. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris, uh, uh, Governor Sandoval was quoted uh, in many newspapers as popular Governor Sandoval, but I think uh, a portion of that popular was that he stayed inside of the executive uh, area and didn't go to the legislature and, you know, wasn't out there as much as, say, a Governor Gwynn was. Do you think that we're going to see Steve Sisolak be more like a Governor Gwynn? Because I always used to joke that uh, <coughs> when Governor Gwynn came on this program, which he did many, many times, he would do half an hour on the show and 45 minutes in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have to remember where they both came from. Uh, Governor Sandoval, very nice guy, very approachable, friendly guy, and, uh, but he, he was a federal judge for a time, uh, and he was a uh, gaming commission, and, and way back when, when, in the assembly. And so uh, he, he was kind of removed from, from direct operational activities. And uh, Governor Sislak with the Clark County Commission, uh, you know, he was in his face all the time and very directly with constituents. And, and I think uh, that's his background. And I think he's going to continue that as, as governor. And why shouldn't he? He's got big Democratic majorities in the legislature to work with. And he doesn't want to be in the unenviable position of vetoing a democratically passed bill. So I think he's playing it very smart to make sure that the legislation is shaped into a format that, that he can sign. Because he's, I think he is uh, of a moderate type, and there's all kinds of uh, people on the, on the liberal to progressive to moderate to even conservative in the legislature. And, um, and so I think he wants to be sure that whatever is passed is something he can sign. Um, it, it's always interesting to see new legislators come to Carson City uh, because they are very hopeful, they've run campaigns, they've taken positions, uh, some very far to the left, um, and then they hit Carson City and there's this realization wow, the system doesn't quite work the way we thought and <laughs> my bill is sitting in somebody's drawer. And it's worse. You wait till the last day and 50 bills get passed and you have no idea what's going on. So, yeah, I think um, there, is, uh, there is a conceptual thinking. And I think most people run for office for good reasons. But once they get there, they realize that reality is completely different from that. And going back to your point about um, Sandoval against Sisolak, I think Brian had his own charm. I remember he took donuts He's to the- very charming. Yeah, um, donuts to the college kids who were protesting in tents and stuff like that, and coffee. So he was, he had his own style, and to Chris's point, he was a little cerebral, a little reserved. Sislak appears to be more of an outgoing type. But at the end of the day, it's symbolic. You know, where they go in terms of policy is the key. Sislak has said a few things, but I'm waiting to see exactly what direction things are going to go in. It's one thing to say no new taxes, and then if you're opening it up for collective bargaining for state employees, that is a de facto tax. To quote Milton Friedman, taxes are not just taxes, but also the, uh, the sum total of taxes, regulation, and everything else. So the real question that Governor Sisolak has to answer is, is this going to increase cost of government? And that's where the rubber meets the road. And that is the question I was going to pose to you, but not quite so eloquently. <laughs> Don, take it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Fees, you know, we hear of fees because it's not a tax. And it's kind of, we, we, our language evolves either to uh, have people put down their guard or change the subject. So, uh, you know, in the industry I represent, fees are a huge issue. Um, going down to testify today on fees. Mm -hmm. So it's thirty to $40,000 per house in Washoe County. 
regardless of how you dice it, that's, that's what the fees and regulatory impact are. So it'll be interesting to watch how this happens. I think one of the things I really, just as on a personal side, I'm watching my entire life, we've always said we're Nevada, we're very business friendly, we're kind of uh, have this libertarian streak where we're not going to meddle too much. We want to be that place where people come. And I hope that remains where we don't uh, fee this and tax this and to where we lose our competitiveness. I think finally people recognize that after years and years of that discussion happening. So I want us to remain super competitive to keep attracting all these people. And when those it's the death of a thousand paper cuts. You know, when you get this fee, that tax, all these things add up and you lose your competitiveness and we look like our neighbors. So I'm not saying that's what anyone's trying right now, but I hope that we're keeping a mindful eye on it through legislation. Chris, you get the last 30 seconds. Well, I, I hope as long as we're business friendly, we can work towards a, a time when people can, with a median income, can afford a medium priced house and, and can afford to uh, do the transportation and I think that's where you can't get lost in being so business friendly that the average person making an average wage can't afford to live here and I think that's the, the big problem and I think Don's probably his association is addressing that uh, with regard to affordable housing and, and I think that's a big issue for Reno it's a big, even bigger issue in Las Vegas I think. Um, I would say it's probably about the same, just in terms, uh, you know, the difference being the, the size, but I think the problems are, are exactly the same. Both markets, housing has slowed down significantly in terms of the increase in prices because people just don't have the money. That's where we got to leave it. Great show. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much indeed. We appreciate thank it. You. See you all, I hope, in Carson City. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back. A bird's eye captures its surroundings at different heights. At Brian Culp of Photography, we can make your imagination soar over buildings, parks, cityscapes, and beyond. Brian's images tell the story and get the job done. If you need a new perspective to tell your story, contact Brian today. Brian Culpa Photography. Experience the bird's eye view at brianculpaphotography.com. Hi, my name's Marilyn Miner, and I'm sure you'd agree that Nevada's a very special place to live. I was born here and my husband and I have raised our family here. I feel it's a privilege to live and work in the Truckee Meadows. I especially enjoy helping my clients reach their real estate goals. Sometimes the smallest details provide the greatest satisfaction. I'd be complimented to talk to you about your next move. Call Marilyn Miner at Dixon Realty, 742-1280 or log on to MarilynMiner.com. St. Ives Florist for every holiday and every special occasion for romance, custom home design. We have the largest selection of fresh flowers in Northern Nevada. And we also offer a large selection of unique gift items. Come see me, Lori Ann, at St. Ives Florist, 700 South Wells Avenue, or call me at 333-9190. Pro Group Management specializes in providing industries with the necessary components to satisfy and exceed workers' comp requirements. Every business has unique needs and specific regulations. Pro Group Management stays ahead of the curve, providing up-to-date services to keep your industry in top form. Discover how we simplify your tasks, improve efficiency, and reduce expense to keep you moving in a positive direction. Pro Group Management. Workers' comp that works for you. On our next broadcast, the Washoe County District Attorney Chris Hicks will join us. We'll see you then.